Well, hello again. I think it's time that I got to the final part of the uh, end game course. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I did put up one puzzle. Uh, I intend to do some more puzzles. I've been a little busy lately, so I, I've been sort of skipping a couple days. And since I don't know how long these three are, if you look at the right side of your screen, um, since I don't know how long these are, I don't know if I'm going to get all through all three, just one or two or whatever. So without any further explanation, I'm just going to start it and I'll start timing it. It is uh, about 17 minutes past 11, somewhere, give or take. And uh, I'll time it from that. So if it gets to be about a half hour, I'll start uh, cutting it short. If, uh, if a half hour passes and it's almost done with the third one, I'll let it complete. So let's keep it under an hour. And here we go. Now we're ready for the most difficult end games of all, Rook and Pawn. We'll start from this position. I reached this endgame against a strong master named Vader in the Donner Memorial Tournament in Amsterdam in 1996. I had the black pieces. As you can see, I'm up a pawn. His rook is on the open line, mine isn't. In rook and pawn in games, it's very important to have control of the open lines. I have a potential past a pawn. His king is slightly more centralized than mine. I think he's but he has weak black, on so I'm going to flip the board. I'm sure you can see after the last few examples of a bishop opposite color in games that he has the potential for two weaknesses. One is the g3 pawn, and one is the defense of my past a pawn. This will be his problem. Black to play. What's your instinct say? What would you play first? One of the most important rules in Rook and Pawn endgames is that the Rook belongs behind the passed Pawn. A lot of players think that you should put a Rook ahead and then move a Pawn towards your Rook. No. The optimal placement of the Rook is behind the passed Pawn. For that reason, I began with a very strong Rook A7. My next two moves, which can't really be stopped, are going to be B4 and A3, pushing the passed Pawn. Remember this rule. Rooks belong behind the passed Pawn. After rook a7, he played king d4, active with the king. I played b4, began to push it. He played rook g2. There's nothing to do but waste time. I played a3. The other rule of pass pawns is pass pawns must be pushed. These are two things that Bruce and I used to work on together. First one, to put your rook behind the pass pawn. The second one, pass pawns must be pushed. a3, b takes a3. How do you take back? Of course, b takes a3 for two reasons. One, it's supported by the rook, and second of all, you want your pawn to be as far away from his king as possible. b takes a3 keeps his rook tied down to the defense. After b takes a3, he has to blockade. Rook a2. Now compare my rook to his. First of all, you see, I have all the scope. My rook can move up and down, maintaining the defense of the pawn, playing moves like rook a4 check. While his rook can't really go anywhere. If he moves away, then I just push my pawn and make queen. If he moves back, I'll immediately push my pawn again, making his position even more claustrophobic. His rook can't move. My rook can move with tempo. I can check him and move back. So what we see is that he's been successful in defending the queen side. My passed pawn has been blockaded. But his rook can't move. Now what remains is for me to activate my king and take advantage of his other weaknesses. Of course, the optimal square is for me to bring my king to g6, h5, and g4. If I get there, then I'm really going after his pawn on g3. So let's make a plan here. First of all, what's the best thing that can happen for me? His rook isn't going to move. Fine. If I try to bring my king to the queen side, he can stop it with his king. Bring my king, for example, to c6, he can play king c4. Bring my king to b6, he can play king b4. This way I'm allowing his king to stay helping the defense of his rook. This would be one way to try, but not the best. Optimally, I want to bring my king to the king side, force his defense to be spread out. It's also important to notice that if he decides to immediately run his king over to the queen side and win the pawn, bring his king to b3, and rook takes a3, then that rook trade will be decisive for me, because inevitably my king will already be, for instance, on g6, and then I would have moves like rook takes a3, king takes a3, king h5 to g4, king takes g3, and all of his pawns fall, and I win easily. So what remains is that my plan is going to be to play king g6 to h5, and hopefully to g4. That's what I want to do. If my king gets to g4, he has to defend the g3 pawn, who plays the king, for instance, on f2. Then I want to break through on the king's side. I want to play the moves h6 and g5. Force all the trades. King takes g5. Then I want to hopefully get my king back to g4. He can maintain that defense, but then I can play f4. 
force another trade. And after we trade that last pair of pawns, we see that he can't defend his pawn on e5. I'll take that, then I'll have a 2 to nothing advantage, and I'll be able to win, because my king can come to his rook, king d5 to c4. His king can't help because it has to stay defending the e-pawn, my king will come to b3, and I'll win. That's my long-term plan. Now let's go back and try to put it into action. It's very useful in endgames to make a plan, to envision what the optimal setup is, and then make it happen. I play king g6, king e3, king h5, king f3. Now, I want to bring my king to g4, we know that. But I can't play king g4, because the king on f3 is guarding the square. How can I get it there? How do you force the black king into the g4 square? Remember the device we used before? Zugzwang. White has no moves. His king is on the only square that covers g4. If his rook moves over, I push the pawn and win the rook. If the rook moves back, I push the pawn and he has no more rook moves and he has the same problem as before. The move g4 hangs both the g4 and the h4 pawn. He has to give up the g4 square if it's his move. So I played rook a4. Waited a moment. He's in Zugzwang, he has to go back, and f2. King g4. Okay, so I've achieved the first two phases of my plan. The first was to get behind the passed pawn, push it down to a3, force his rook into passive defense. Did it. The second was to occupy g4 with the king. Did that. He played king g2. Do you remember what our next step was? Start breaking through the kingside pawn. h6. King f2. g5. Now obviously I have threats to win pawns both ways. He has to make the trades. Takes, takes. F takes g5. King takes g5. Now, he played king f3. Once again, I want to occupy the g4 square. How do you do it? Here I triangulated. I played king h5. I could have lost the tempo by moving my rook back, but I played king h5. If he moves his king, of course, I'll play king g4 and I've achieved what I want. He played rook h2 check. I played king to g6. He has to bring his rook back. Rook a2, and now king g5. I've lost the move. White to move. He has to go back. My opponent now saw that my plan was inevitable and he resigned. Why? Let's go over the winning plan again. He's got to move his king. Say king e3. I play king g4. He has to defend the pawn. King f2. I play f4. He has to take it. G takes f4. King takes f4. Now he can't defend his e-pawn with rook e2 because I would play a2. He has to play king e2. I play king takes e5. And now I have two pawns. Let's try to defend with white. King e3. King d5. King d3. e5. Now he has a question. If he plays king c3, I can just push my pawn, e4. Slowly but surely, I'll push him back. Say he plays king b3, attacking the rook. I play rook a8. White could try a last-ditch attempt to trade places of rook and king. He can play rook d2 check, king e5, and then do the blockade with king a2. Notice that I was threatening to play a2, immediately trade off rook, and then win the king and pawn in game. If he plays king a2, it's okay. This isn't that any better. Now I play e3. Rook e2, king e4, the rook can't stop the pawn. My king easily wins the game. Once again, we see that two weaknesses are too hard to defend. So I wanted your first exposure to these rook and pawn in games to be a somewhat simple one. I was up a pawn, I used the basic principles, I got behind the pass pawn, I pushed it, I tied his rook down to the defense, then I focused on the other side of the board. I put my king to g4, I put him in zugzwang to force my way in, I traded down, simplified, and he resigned because he was going to lose the second pawn, and his weaknesses were too much to hold on to. This is a very good example of how to win a technical rook and pawn in game. Now we're going to take a look <coughs> at more double-edged ones, where it's more of a fight. Well, that was relatively quick, so right away, without saying much. Number two. So far, the rook and pawn in games that we've looked at have begun in a defined pawn structure. This game is different. We just made the transition into the end game. I'm up a pawn. My opponent was a young French grandmaster named Etienne Bacro, a very talented player. I have the black pieces, he's white. We played this game in Bermuda, 1999. As this end game develops, I want you to notice the pawn structure. Again, I'm going to notice flip it. the structural decisions, and I want you to feel the competitive moment. 
Watch how I repeat the moves, how I pressure him, how I slowly increase my advantage and try to convert into the win. He began with rook c1, trading the b-pawn for my c-pawn, a good decision as, the act as to activate his rook. I played rook takes b2, rook takes c5. Usually a rook on the 7th rank is very, very dangerous. Bruce Pendolfini used to call a rook on the 7th a pig, because it has a way of gobbling up pawns, and it also limits the mobility of the other guy's king. A very good weapon. But now, he's threatening to play rook c7. His rook wants to go to the 7th, and I have to leave my active position to prevent his. If, for example, he would be allowed to play rook c8 check, king f7, rook c7 check, I'd lose my a-pawn, and all my advantage would go away. I have to stop that. I played rook b7. He played rook a5, king f7. Now his rook is very active. He has some compensation for the pawn. King f2, king f6, centralizing. King f3. Now I want to fix his kingside pawn structure. Create weaknesses. I played the strong move, h5. Now this is only possible because of his last move. The king being on f3, if he plays rook takes h5, then I'll immediately play rook b3 check, the king moves, and after rook takes a3, I have two pass pawns. Once again, we feel the principle of two weaknesses. Two pass pawns for him to deal with is very hard. So my h5 pawn was indirectly protected by my tactic on his h3 pawn. My next move is going to be h4. I want to tie down the weakness to, on g2. The one element which makes it very difficult for me to succeed in this endgame is that the two weaknesses that he really has to deal with are my e pawn and his g2 pawn. The problem is that they're too close together. It's very difficult to convert this endgame advantage because I can't draw him away from one weakness with another one. After h5, he played king e4, and I played h4. Now this was move 30. The time control in this game was 40 moves in 2 hours, and then we get another hour for the next 20 moves. We were both in time pressure, and rushing a little bit here. So you'll notice that we started repeating moves a little bit. The rule of threefold repetition states that if any exact position arises on the chessboard three times, then the game is officially a draw. A lot of the time in converting an advantage and trying to reach time control, and also trying to falsely establish a sense of security in your opponent, you'll allow the position to repeat a few times, but not three. He played king f4, rook c7, king g4. I played rook c4 check, king f3, rook c3 check. Now he has to make a choice. If he plays king up to g4, he has to be careful of a move like g5. Very strong. He can't play rook takes g5 because of rook g3 check, winning the rook. And after rook takes a7, rook g3 check, king h5, rook takes g2, he's in big trouble. My e-pawn is passed, nothing can get in its way, and his king is paralyzed on the side of the board. Of course, he's not going to make that mistake. After rook c3, he went back, king f2. I went back rook c7, defending my pawn, and after king f3 I played g5. So from those checks I was able to establish my pawn structure, exactly what I wanted. King e3, rook c3 check, king f2, rook c7. This repetition of moves was only with the aim of reaching time control. Also you should remember that there's no danger of threefold repetition once you've made a pawn move. Any pawn move starts that repetition afresh. King e3, rook b7. King f3, now I played rook b3 check. King f2, rook b7. Now we've made move 40. He played king e3, rook c7, king f3, rook b7. King e3 again, rook b3 check, king f2. Now stop. Put yourself in my position. You've been pressuring your opponent for a very, very long time. These moves took a lot of time. All of his defense has been very, very accurate. He's defending very well. I've been trying to push him back, trying to push him back. His defense is very solid. I've seen that with my rook on the 7th rank, it's almost impossible for me to break through. Now I've played rook b3 check, king goes to f2. In order to continue, I'm going to have to sacrifice a pawn. Evaluate the move e5. What did you think? This is one of the hardest kinds of moves to make in chess. When a player has an advantage, it's very easy to fall into a state of comfort to believe that the position is slightly better for you and so the debate is almost whether or not you'll win or draw. This is a very dangerous psychological situation because often you have to take calculated risks in order to convert the advantage into a win. Careful defense entices risks. My opponent's been defending very well. 
E5 was a hard decision to make, but it was a good one. I sacrificed my pawn. Suddenly I'm no longer up material. He has an outside pass pawn, but now my king can get into the game. Notice a big problem with the endgame before was that my king was cut off from the struggle. If I could get my king to f5 and f4, it would be very good for me. But there was no way to do this. With his king on f3, if I play e5, he can always play the move king e4. I don't have the move rook b4 check because the a pawn covers that square. And his next move can always be rook a6 check, forcing me back. So here I took the risk, e5. Now things get very tense. We're in the sixth hour of competition. A lot of pressure. I've had a better game, a better game, a better game. And now I've sacrificed a pawn, taken a risk. This is when things get really tight. Rook takes a7, king f5. Now I'm sure you see my plan. My idea is to first drive his king back to the first rank, then push my king ab up to e3 or g3, and start moving with my e pawn. I can even mate him. Think, for example, if my king is on f4, if I play rook b2 check, if he goes back to g1 after king g3, he's in big trouble. But be careful. If his rook was on the f file, rook f3 would be mate. I gotta look out for his traps as well. But that's my idea, to put my king, for example, to e4, to play rook b2 to f1, then I could even play king e3, threatening mate. He's forced to go to g1, then I can play rook b1 check, force his king to h2, then start pushing my e-pawn. This is very strong for me. He played rook f7 check, king e4, and rook g7. Rook b2 check, king g1. Black to move. What do you do? It was in this position that I threw away the win. I had played the endgame very, very well, forcing him to defend, to defend. I made him think that he might have had the draw in hand, and then I sacrificed a pawn, so he had a sense of security finally, and then he had to begin the battle anew. This is a very, very important psychological trick. By repeating the moves, you can make your opponent lose presence a little bit. Now we've reached this position. He attacked my pawn on g5. Here I lost time. I played king f4. My idea was that I'm threatening king g3, he has to check me, and then I can play the king to e3, preparing e4. This was a critical mistake because I allowed his rook to force its way behind his own passed pawn. But first let's look at what I should have done. After rook g7, the key to winning will be to sacrifice yet another pawn. The move king d3 was terribly strong. After rook takes g5, I would play e4. Now, of course, I have the threat immediately of e3, rook b1 check, and then after king h2, e2, and e1. He has to do something about that. He would play rook d5 check. Then I have king e2. Again, threatening rook b1 check. The pawn is coming. This position is completely winning. Say he plays rook h5, goes after my other pawn. I play rook b1 check, king h2, e3. Now, if he takes my pawn, I can just move my king out of the way. He has to sacrifice his rook by playing rook h8, e2, rook e8. But then after e1, rook takes, rook takes. The position is easily winning. He does have three pawns, but my king can easily blockade one while the rook goes after the other. For example, if he plays h4, I play king e4. And then after king h3, I can just play king f5, followed by king g6. I take his pawn with my rook. And then in this kind of position, it's very easy to win. I just pin him, for example, drive him back slowly, and then take the pawn. This would be a very easy win. So the way to win this rook and pawn in game involved the sacrifice of two pawns. I had to move from being up material to down material. That's a very difficult thing to do psychologically when you're trying to convert an endgame because you want to convert the advantage while maintaining control of the position. Sometimes this is impossible. Rook and pawn in games sometimes require inspired decisions. Take a look at what I did instead. I played king f4. I thought this would also be winning, threatening king g3. My impression was that he would be forced to check me, and I would just gain a tempo. My king would be one square further up the board, and he'd have to go back to g7. <clears throat> I missed something very important. He had the move rook f3 check. And after my king moves to d4, he played the very strong rook f2, offering a trade of rooks and forcing his way behind his passed pawn. And now all the themes we've been looking at come into one. First of all, psychologically, in the moment when I was closest to the win, I made my big mistake. I relaxed a little bit. When you start to think about the result often in competition, you lose presence. Also, we see the theme of rooks going behind the passed pawn. The point is that he wants to ideally maneuver his rook to a2. If I play rook b3, he immediately plays rook a2, defends my pawn's advance from 
to the second rank and begins to play a4, a5, a6. If I play rook b1 check, he plays rook f1, blocks it that way. I can't trade rooks obviously because he has the outside pass pawn and he can blockade my pawn with his king, move his pawn, take my pawn, and eventually win the endgame. So I have to avoid that. I would have to now go rook b3. But then he would play rook a1 and we'd have a big problem. e4, a4, e3, the king can now come king f1. He blockades with his king and pushes his pawn. It's a draw. When he played rook f2, he offered me a draw. And I thought for some time, tried to figure out a way out of it, and I had to agree. I missed my chance. The key moment was the sacrifice of the second pawn. I let his rook get back into the defense, and there was no way to win. If you feel like it, analyze this in game out. Make sure you understand why it's a draw. Okay. Well, it hasn't been a half hour yet. So, in this one, Josh has said that he threw away the win. That was very interesting. Let's see what he did in the third example. Obviously, we have enough time to play it. And then, the next time it'll be the psychology of competition and annotated games. But in any case, here's the third part of this rook and pawn ending. Watkin, Waitkin versus, how do you pronounce that name? Grimali? Yeah, that's Grimali. Here we go. Now we're going to take a look at a different kind of rook and pawn game. The last one was technical. I was winning, and I controlled the game. This one is a race, a fight, a struggle. It's a double-edged battle where both players have chances. It was played in Bermuda in 1998. My opponent was a strong, young British international master named Danny Gormali. I was white. Let's take a look at the position. First of all, I have a passed pawn, and he doesn't. An important difference. His rooks are basically defensive. Their job is to blockade my c-pawn, stop it from going. He has to also watch the a-pawn. He loses the a5 pawn, for instance, if you were to play here, rook takes f4. After rook takes a5, I'll have two very dangerous passed pawns. He can't allow that. We're going to enter the struggle in a key psychological moment. He played the move rook fc5 and offered a draw. Now, I had been pressing for a win the whole game. I had a very small advantage. He had been defending well. This position should be objectively drawn. The draw offer is a very interesting psychological moment in competition. What often happens to a player is that when he's prepared to offer a draw, in that moment that he believes that the game has actually become drawish, or even if he's just hoping that the opponent will accept the draw, there's a tendency to relax because of the offer a draw to subconsciously give up the struggle a little bit. And this, I believe, is what happened to my opponent. He had been defending very, very well. And on the move that he offered the draw, he made an imprecise move. Playing rook fc5 tied him down to the defense too much. The correct maneuver would have been king d6 to c6. The move king d6 immediately. This way, the rook on f5 could tie me down a little bit to the defense of the f4 pawn. His king could blockade the c pawn, and he should be able to generate a little bit of activity. After king d6, I probably would have accepted the draw. But he played rook fc5. An error. Keep this in mind when you're playing games. If you offer a draw, the game isn't over. Your opponent has to accept it. Keep the fight until the fight is over. After rook fc5, I continued with rook b8. The position is far from winning. I have a very, very small advantage due to my pass c pawn and active rook. We'll see how it continued. Rook d7 check. Now I brought my king over. King c3. My plan is if he attacks my pawn again, to play king b3. Then I want to play the move rook b5. If he trades rooks, then I'll have two connected pass pawns. He can't do that. Both his rooks now are tied down by my one rook. This could create an awkward tension for him. And in fact, he did play rook dc7. I played king b3. And now he played king f6. I played rook b5, and he played king f5. Now the game has gotten very exciting. For many, many moves, we've been playing a very similar kind of endgame. I've had a very small advantage, pressing, pressing, controlling the game. He's been defending very well. Then he offered me a draw. He made an imperfect move. I declined the draw offer and decided to play aggressively for the win. Now the complexion of the game has changed. Suddenly he's no longer trying to build up an impenetrable wall. He's counterattacking. I'm attacking on the queen side. 
he's counterattacking on the king's side. Suddenly the game looks like a race. I'm going to be going with the queen side pawns. He's going to be going with the king side pawns. Now I move back, king c3. I took advantage of the placement of his king. Of course, if his king were, had been on f6, then he'd have rook takes c4 check. Now his rook on c5 is pinned to the king. But this is also a pawn sacrifice. I'm playing for the win, but I've sacrificed a pawn in doing it. He played the move king takes f4. And now the race is on. I played rook takes c5, rook takes c5, and king d4. He has to go back. Rook c7. Rook c8 is the more natural looking option. It's logical to be further away from my king, but the downside is it doesn't defend the f7 pawn, and I can play rook f2 check, takes f7. He has to watch that pawn. I played c5, he played f5. Now why don't you take some time now, stop and calculate this position out a little bit. See who you think is going faster. Every single move is precise. Take some time. What do you think? I played c6. He began with g5. It's hard for him to support the advance of his f-pawn. For instance, after king g4, f4, f3, there's no way to support f2, because the king can't get there. He has to use another pawn, g5. King c5. And king comes into the race. h5. So now we see his plan is to play g4, h4, and g3. I play king b6, rook c8. Now I had to make a key decision. Do I want to play king b7, followed by c7 and c8? Or do I want to play king takes a5, followed by king b6 to b7? A very important decision. Stop now. Calculate. What do you think is better? I played king takes a5. King b7 was also sufficient to win, but it wasn't quite as precise. Rook f8, c7, g4. Now, first thing you have to notice is that if white tries to not allow the black rook to sacrifice itself for the pawn and play rook d2, it doesn't work. Because after rook d8, black can always play rook f7, pinning the pawn and sacrificing next move. White has to play c8. Rook takes c8. Now in the game, I played king takes c8. But this would be a big blunder now, because I'm behind in the race. After h4, king b7, g3, king b6, king g4, king takes a5, f4, king b4, f3, a5, f2, black's going to queen first. After rook c1, g2, I'm in big trouble. I can't take back with the king. So I would have to take back with the rook. Rook takes c8. Now h4, king b6. There's another variation which is interesting, and since we're analyzing, we might as well analyze deeply. I could play rook h8, which is logical, because the rule rooks belong behind past pawns applies both to attack and defense. The best place to defend a past pawn is also from behind. So rook h8 looks nice, but it doesn't quite work here, because after the variation h3, king b6, king f3, king takes a5, king g2, king b4, king takes pawn, a5, g3, a6, g2, and yes, rook and pawn in games can be this complicated, a7, g1, queen. We both make queens, but it looks very, very unlikely that I'll be able to get out of perpetual check. My rook and queen being in the corner caused me big problems. His queen can immediately start checking me, for instance, boom, and my king has to find a place to hide. I can't even interpose with my queen is a very important detail, because if I do, if we trade queens, imagine them coming off the board, then black can just move over his king and then push his pawn and win my rook. The only way I could hope to win this position would be to somehow get out of the checks and then attack him with my rook and queen, but that's not going to happen. This should be a draw. So rook h8 doesn't work for that reason. King b6, g3, h takes g3, h takes g3, king takes a5, g2. Now stop. What do you think of this position? Think of all the knowledge you've accumulated in this endgame course. I want you to stop now. Calculate it out. What's the evaluation of this position?
Well, that was a long silence. I suppose he wants me to push play. Um, I just want you to realize I did not flip the board this time because Josh Waits can, is the white player this time. Okay, so player will push. Yeah, it even says, pausing while you think about the current position, press play button from the move list above to, to resume. Okay. <clears throat> well, this is what I think. I think that Rook should go here behind the pass pawn. Because even if the king comes up, you can still sacrifice the rook for that pawn. And white will be ahead of the race. So let's see what he says. I obviously have to stop him from queening. Rook g8. There it is. King f3. King b4. Black plays king f2. White to move. What do you do? Well, he moved his king first, but I still think any time now, any time between now and, and after he gets the queen, it doesn't matter, I think. Um, I think probably pushing the pawn now would be okay. But let me see what he says. Okay, the most natural idea is to push your pawn, right? Are you sure that's the right decision? Let's take a look at it. After a5, he makes a queen. You take it. King takes. Looks like white is way ahead in the race, right? Yeah, it does. a6, f4, a7, f3. We make a queen. f2. Now think back to the theory you learned in the game against Laputian. Do you remember about queen against king and pawn? The bishop pawn is drawn because of the important stalemating idea. Mm. Queen g8 check. The king moves. You slowly bring your queen into the game. You bring your queen in. And now in the critical moment, when you want to chase the king to defend the pawn in front of the pawn, and then you could bring your king, he moves to the corner, threatening to queen. And if I take his pawn, it's stalemate. So this long, long, complicated variation would end in a draw. Wow. I queen first. Because it's a bishop pawn, and he gets it to the seventh rank, it's a forced draw. That would be a very depressing end. Think about the last question I asked you, though. In this position, I asked you what your best move was. I'm sure most of you thought a5, yes. Well, I said to take the rook. We see that just barely, pawn. we're not in time, he gets the pawn to the seventh, and it's a draw. The only way to win would be king c4. Really? f4, king d4. Now, if he makes a queen, I just take it. And after king e4, I win his pawn, and then make a queen with my own. He plays f3. I attack the pawn from behind, king e4. Once again, he can't queen, because I take it, and then take his f pawn. His only move is king e2. Otherwise, of course, he would lose the defense of the pawn. But now he's paralyzed. I play a5, and there's no way for black to make progress. If he pushes the f pawn, I just play rook takes g2. Pinning the pawn, my next move will be rook takes, and then I make a queen and win the game. This is how hard rook and pawn in games are. Don't be afraid to calculate. Now, I played king takes a5. Prepared the second pass pawn. <clears throat> g4, king b6. h4, king b7. Rook f8, c7. And he played g3. I made a queen. He sacrificed his rook. How do you take back? Obviously with the king, my rook is important for defense. He played king g4, preparing the f-pawn. a5, f4, if you haven't already calculated out for here. a6, f3, a7, f2. We both make queens, but I get the extra tempo. a8, f1. Now, I hope you looked at this position a long time ago and found the right move. What did I play? Queen e4 check is decisive. He resigned now. Because after queen f4, blocking, what's the best move? I can win the queen by force. h3 check. If he plays king takes h3, I play queen takes queen. If he plays king g5, after rook check, now it's all over. He can't defend the queen. If instead he plays king h3, what did I have in mind? Queen e6 check. The only way to stop me is to block. Queen takes f5, check me. 
His only last attempt is to bring his king into the open board. But now it'll end very quickly. After rook c5 check, the king has to run. The queen can check. The king has to run. It's force mate now. I'm sure you can do it from here. For example, rook g5 check. The king goes to the corner. Now mate in two. Queen g8 check. King h6. And that queen g7 or queen g6 will be checked. So the rook and pawn in game moved into a race, which moved into both of us queening. Me queening a tempo ahead. I had the rook. And so I immediately was able to check and force mate. A lot of the time, when you move into a queen in game, there's a chance for the defender to try a perpetual check. But in this case, I queen first. And that is it. <clears throat> well, that was very interesting. I, would, I wouldn't have thought about moving my king first. But in any case, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe. Please comment with your questions or comment with what you would like to see. I will be sticking uh, some puzzles in between these videos. Um, but let me go back for a minute. As you can see, the next one is the psychology of the competition. And what this is, is a handful of games. I haven't played these. I mean, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't seen these yet, so I don't know how long they are. But uh, that'll be the next start in the next videos. You know, if I play a, tr a trap or a uh, puzzle in between, that's okay too. But we'll see. In any case, keep on playing.